One of the many ways that law school did not actually prepare you for legal practice was that it didn't teach you effective time management skills. So in this episode and in a few to follow, I'm going to talk about some fundamental time management skills that you can use to produce work more quickly and efficiently without necessarily sacrificing quality along the way. My name is Chris Hargraves, I'm from tipslawyers.com where we teach practical skills for young lawyers looking to excel and advance in their careers. So time management. Law school was not the best platform, nor for that matter is any study the best platform for learning time management and productivity in a commercial context. Why do I say that? I say that because by and large you have an unlimited time to prepare for or sometimes even execute the task at hand. And that is not reality most of the time. So let's take the assignment that you're given three months to do. So you spend the first two and a half months doing nothing at all. And then for the last couple of weeks, within reason, you can spend all of the available hours that you have and in which you are functional to work on that assignment. And the end result will bear the fruit associated with that labor. You, of course, may spend five hours, you may, may spend 10 hours, you may spend 20 hours, and the overall amount of time you spend doesn't have any impact on anyone other than you and anyone you're supposed to be looking after or spending time with in that duration. So this is, I guess, a poor foundation upon which to then go into what is typically a commercial environment. I recognize there are non-commercial law firms, but a commercial environment fundamentally where the amount of time you spend on something is actually a critical component of whether the time you have spent is valuable or not. And then we run into a problem. We run into the problem that if you want to produce a high quality product, it sometimes takes more time than you are comfortable with. So how can we start to address this situation? How can we as young lawyers start to look at tasks and produce them in a time that is efficient, but also come out the other end with a product that is actually high quality? So the worst combination here, obviously, is to spend a lot of time on something, and I mean time in two directions, I mean both number of days between getting the task and handing in what you were supposed to do, but also time in absolute terms. How many actual hours have you spent dedicated to that task? Okay, so that's what this conversation is all about. Both of those topics, not just one of them. So the worst outcome is that you take a lot of time, so you take two weeks and 55 hours of your actual devoted effort to produce a topic or a piece of work, something you were supposed to produce. And at the end of that, what you hand up is poor. That's bad. That's, that's just fundamentally bad if it was supposed to be a task that should have taken three and a half hours and been relatively easily to, easy to hand up a fully fledged, high quality, nearly done piece of work that only required a little bit of a fine tuning here and there from whoever was supposed to finalize it for you. That's bad. Everyone knows that's bad. You know that's bad, but no one has actually armed you at any point yet with the tools to avoid that badness. Okay, so that's what we're trying to avoid. What we're trying to have is a task that is done as quickly as is reasonable, having regard to the nature of the task, but that is also high quality in the sense that it answers the question or questions that were put to you in the first place. It does what the task you were supposed to do was supposed to actually achieve. It achieves that purpose and it doesn't have simple errors in the sense that you've missed things you were supposed to do or basic errors in terms of typos and stuff like that. Okay, that's our goal. That's what we're aiming for. It is actually, let's be fair, very hard to do. Okay, so don't go into this thinking that this is something easy. It is something you actually need to dedicate yourself to and think consciously about. The first thing you need to think consciously about is how long should the task actually take you in terms of hours? How many hours, minutes, 
full days, whatever, should the task actually take you. And one thing you need to bear in mind is that the amount of time the task might take me, if I have done it 92 times before, at my charge out rate, if you have charge out rates in your firm, and the amount of time that task may take you, if you have never done it before, you don't really know what you're doing, you're still feeling your way, even with a certain amount of guidance from your mentors or superiors on that job, then they're gonna be different, okay? Those two things are not the same. And that is factored in. It's factored into how much you're paid, it's factored into how much your time is charged to the client at. And I should say, just on a little tangent, this applies whether or not your firm engages in time billing, okay? I know time billing has become the great evil of the 21st century, and for that matter, you know, will probably stay the great evil for some time, but it's irrelevant to an extent whether or not your time transfers directly to how much the client is billed, because ultimately your time comes at a cost and the value that has been measured for the production of this task for your client and the amount that they will be billed because they're going to be billed something is referable to an assessment of what this task is supposed to be worth, how much it is supposed to be adding in terms of value, or whatever methodology has been used to arrive at the fee that will be rendered. So if there is an enormous disparity, five hours versus 50 hours say, between how much time it ought to have taken, at least in the brains of the people who came up with the estimate of fees, and how much time it did in fact take, that is going to cost someone money. It could cost your client money, or it could cost your firm money, okay? So that's why we care. It's not just about time billing, it's about the fact that it actually costs someone money if you're unable to be productive and efficient. It's not necessarily the client, it could just be your firm eats it. But either way, someone somewhere in the equation is gonna get tired of that if it's not something you're improving on steadily over time, okay? So you as a junior lawyer will probably take longer to do some things than a very experienced lawyer might do. It might be because you know slightly less about the procedures, it might be because you just haven't done that process enough times for it to really just roll straight out of your fingertips for the first 10 or 20 or 30 times compared to someone who's been doing it for many years. That's how it's supposed to be. So you can give yourself a little bit of forgiveness if how long you see a senior lawyer take to do something is very different from how long it takes you to do it, okay? I know that a lot of junior lawyers really feel this topic and they are conscious of how long is some, something is taking it's just a matter that they don't necessarily know how to make it take less time or, and this is going to be today's discussion, they don't really know how long it should take in the first place. Okay, so that's probably a good place to move on to today's main topic and that is understanding how much time a task ought to take is a critical component to doing that task efficiently. Why? There is a long-standing principle and while it is not a universal law of everything, it is I think a generally true statement that a task and the time you take to do that task will expand the amount of time you give yourself to do that task. That's why when I mentioned the assignment before, the assignment is always done right before it is due and typically not done significantly before it is due. Why? Because you have in your brain, subconsciously or otherwise, planned to have it done right at the end, unless you have taken deliberate and conscious steps to do otherwise. So there is a principle at play here, and it does tend to be true. Now imagine then, let's just assume that principle is true, which observation can probably confirm for you. What happens if you don't give yourself or no other person gives you an amount of time to spend on a given task? Well, the end result is that you just keep spending time on the task until you feel like it's done. Now, in a sense, that seems like a very fair thing to do because after all, you need the task to be done properly and surely you need to just spend as much time as it's going to take. But in practice, that doesn't work. You inevitably spend more time on something than you should if you haven't given yourself some parameters to work within. Now, in effective delegation, 
you should be getting from your delegator, I guess, is <laughs> whoever's giving you the work, even if it's a, a sideways exchange or, or an up and down exchange, whatever it is, whoever's giving you the work in an ideal world should give you an indication of how long they think the task should take in terms of, Chris, I want you to spend no more than three hours on this task, please. Or this should not be a task that takes you more than five hours or something like that. That is a good system of delegation. Sometimes those of us delegating overestimate the simplicity of a task, or we might overestimate how quickly you're able to do something, and we might give you an unreasonably short time frame, which is simply not possible to complete the task in. However, by and large, you should take that estimate as an experienced guide from a senior person who's been there and done that to how long that thing should take you as a junior lawyer. And if you give yourself that time frame, then you are going to find that that is going to put you in a good place to be working efficiently. Because once you have that, let's say you have five hours to do a task. Let's say for our example, the task is producing a list of documents in litigation, for those of you not in this jurisdiction, in Queensland at least, what you have to do is produce a list, most of the time, of all of the documents in your client's possession or control that are relevant to the allegations in issue in the proceedings, and you have to have that in a particular form and deliver it to the other party. And that is your obligation of disclosure. Some states call it discovery, we call it disclosure, so there you have it. It is a task that nobody particularly enjoys. So let's say you're doing this task that nobody particularly enjoys because it is, it is often a task done by junior lawyers and your senior lawyer giving you this task says, this should take you no more than five hours to do this. Okay, what are the steps you have to do within that five hour period? What do you need to allow for? This is the process you need to go through. What are the steps that you personally have to do within a five hour window to produce a list of documents in a form that is not littered with errors? Well, the first thing, if it's the first time you're doing it, is figure out the form you have to use, understand the tests you need to do. Okay, so how do you determine relevance? How do you determine what's an allegation and issue in the proceedings? If you don't know the answers to these questions, or the person delegating it to you didn't give you those answers and you're too terrified to ask, then you need to give yourself a little bit of time to actually understand what those principles mean. Okay, let's say you give yourself half an hour, which I think is reasonable. Okay, you do not need to do a cascade of unbelievably complex research. You have not been asked to do a cascade of unreasonably complex research, what you've been asked to do is produce a list of documents. So stay focused on the task you have been given and do what is required to get that task done. 30 minutes to figure out actually what you're doing and what forms you're supposed to use and how they look, okay? Maybe you ask someone for a precedent just so you can get an idea of how your firm describes things in lists of documents. Maybe you're new to the matter. You don't know where the documents are stored. You haven't necessarily read all the pleadings, so you don't know what the issues are, okay? Perhaps you need to then give yourself an hour and a half to look at where the documents are stored to understand the allegations in issue in the proceedings. Maybe you can, within that hour and a half, also order the documents in some vaguely sensible way if that has not already been done, okay? So you're now up to two hours out of your five hour relatively unilateral time frame that you've been given. Two fifths of your time has been spent. You know now exactly what you're doing. You understand the principles you're doing it with. You've got an understanding of the allegations in issue and the proceedings, and you have hopefully at least had a bit of a beginning look at the documents you're going to need to go through. Now, if at this point you realize that there are 9,750 documents that you have to read in order to produce this list of documents, the best thing you can do is go back to the person who delegated this to you and say, hey Joe, um, you wanted me to do this list of documents in five hours. I see there's 9,750 documents you want me to review. I've got my head around the pleadings. I understand what I'm doing, but I'm concerned I'm not gonna be able to do that in the time that is available. Am I missing something? that this was a task that was supposed to be done within five hours? Am I looking at things I'm not supposed to be looking at? Am I, am I opening folders I'm not supposed to open? Or is there something I'm missing in this situation? But where I stand right now, I think it's going to take longer. Nothing is more annoying to a senior practitioner than 
thinking someone is working away to have something done in five hours and then being told 23 hours later that you just decided of yourself that it was going to take way, way longer, but it's okay because you stayed back after work and worked till midnight to do it, okay? That's not actually okay. Probably you don't make those decisions, if at all possible. You certainly don't get to blow out the client's budget for disclosure by a factor of four just because you had some time after work, okay? I get the diligence and I get the hard work thing, but your senior people on a matter need to be informed because they have ethical obligations to keep their client apprised of changes in potential costs. Now, maybe they won't do anything. Maybe they'll say, oh, did I say five? I meant 50, go for it, sorry, my bad. But whatever the case might be, you need to tell them if the time frame you have been given is just functionally, completely, and not at all even vaguely possible. If, however, you've got your three hours of time left, you understand what you're doing, what the issues are, and you see that there are 100 documents, and you go, okay, 100 documents, they're all gonna be varying lengths, but by and large, it's gonna be a huge chunk of emails in there, they're gonna be fairly quick to review. It's 100 documents in three hours. If I'm reviewing them and doing my list at the same time, then I have about 30 and a bit documents to do each hour. That's a document every two minutes. That's reasonable, I can do that, let's get to work, okay? Go through the process, understand how long it should take, Sure, you're going to be estimating a little bit, you're going to be winging it a little bit, but if you don't do it, you will inevitably go over because you're not actually managing your time at all. You're actually, and this happens a lot, ignoring the time parameters that you were given because, oh, it just took longer. Now, if it takes five hours and 15 minutes instead of five hours on the spot, that's not a problem. But if it takes 10 hours and you didn't tell anyone, that is a problem, that's double. Okay, if you got a plumber to do some work and they gave you a quote and then they just did the work and then sent you a bill for double, are you happy? I don't think you are. Neither is anyone else, okay? Treat the people you're working for as if they're your clients and that's a good way to go about it. What would they like to know? What should they know? It doesn't mean you need to bug them. I'm not saying bug them at every step of the way and I'm not saying be annoying. I'm just saying if there's a critical juncture where you realize that in no way are you going to meet the requirements of the task, you need to update them because you might be missing something, they might be underestimating something, someone might need to be told, and you don't generally have the authority to take those decisions out of the hands of your supervisor, okay? So how can you do it? You give yourself a time frame, you understand the task you're supposed to do within that time frame, and you break it down into those pieces. Okay, we did our research, we did our reading, we did our organization, and then we drafted our list and we figured out either that we could or we could not fit that within the time available. That is the absolute rule number one, whether or not you are given a time frame. So what happens if you're not given a time frame by the person delegating to you? Well, give yourself a time frame. I mean, ideally ask, but if for whatever reason, maybe the person has gone immediately away on holidays and they're uncontactable, maybe they're terrifying and they're not the kind of question uh, person you can ask questions of. Stuff like that happens, I get that. You can't always find out how long a task should take. So take a punt. Or do you have access to the estimate that's been given to the client? Can you look for yourself, be proactive? That's the kind of initiative that is good. How much is the disclosure process supposed to cost if you've given and fully, you know, sort of itemized estimate to the client in respect of this litigation, then maybe that communication has already gone out and you can judge from there. You take the full amount, you allow a portion for your time and a portion for it to be reviewed and maybe some questions and for it to be settled and a draft to go back to the client and that sort of thing. And then you give yourself a time frame based on how much you know your hourly rate is or how much the equivalent hourly rate is going to be for your time and you go from there, okay? You just really need to turn your mind to it is the main thing. Take a few minutes to offer a procedure to yourself that fits within a particular time. And this gives you the best bet of actually being able to do the work efficiently. Now, this particular tip has gone on long enough. So in the next one, we're going to talk a bit more about the idea of delivering the work that is high quality within the time available. But I can give you a hint right now, it relates to the steps that you allow yourself within the given time. 
okay? So if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe because that one's going to be good, I think, for a lot of people to be able to up their game in terms of delivering quality work. And the future episodes are going to deal more and more with this topic because I know it's a big one, it's a difficult one to get around, but if you can take these tips on board, I genuinely believe they will help you over time. That's all for today. I'll see you next time.